Welcome. This is Libawit Lily Gurma from TourismLens.com, and you're listening to the Tourism Lens Podcast. Whether remote working, vacationing, or settling abroad, more people than ever are traveling and having an impact on the places they visit, on the environment, but also on host communities. On this show, I sit down with global sustainability thinkers and advocates to discuss critical, thorny issues in tourism. They'll share ideas and solutions they use so we can all learn to be better tourism leaders and travelers. On today's episode, I discuss efforts to manage sargassum in the Dominican Republic with my guest, Jake Keel, Vice President at Grupo Punta Cana Foundation. We will also discuss the foundation's innovative coal restoration work. And towards the latter part of the conversation, we'll talk about traveler behavior when it comes to giving back and learning on vacation. Is it fact or myth? Make sure you listen all the way through. Jake, thanks so much for being here on the Tourism Lens podcast. I'm really excited to talk to you today. Hello, thanks for having me. So, um, Jake, I mean, I've known of your work for a while, but for our listeners, you are at the uh, Grupo Punta Cana Foundation, and I see it as some kind of a big experimental lab, if you will. Um, that's actually located on a co the same compound where you have your luxury hotels at a distance, but you experiment on numerous solutions to um, environmental issues, wildlife, community, all of the things that tourism impacts, and you come up with solutions. Um, and so I, I would love for you to kind of give me your take on how you see your, your sustainability center and how it's evolved over the years. Yeah. So th thanks for having me. I think uh, the best way to describe what we do is an innovation lab that's essentially using uh, a private company, in this case, Grupo Punta Cana, uh, which is a resort development, includes uh, hotels, you know, three hotel properties and more in the future, uh, real estate and residential communities uh, and all the kind of related uh, facilities related to that. And then in our case, we're a, a little more than just a normal resort. <laughs> we have a, an electric company, a uh, water distribution company, yes. water treatment plant, uh, and an <laughs> yeah. international airport. So an we've airport, got a, right. a great diversity of businesses. And so what we try and yes. do is solve different uh, environmental and social challenges that are affecting the tourism industry. Uh, and resorts like ours, uh, using the resort as our guinea pig. Uh, and then once we come up with solutions or if the solutions we come up with fail and need to be tweaked and improved upon, sharing that information with other companies, with other communities and with, with other resorts to try and yeah. achieve a greater impact than just our little slice of, of Punta Cana. Let's just list some of the, some of the areas that, that you work in, coral restoration, um, waste management also, right? We do. We work in solid waste management, uh, coral reef management. So we have a co-management agreement of a marine protected area. Uh, and as the case is in much of the Caribbean, because the reef is fairly degraded, now we're in coral restoration. So trying to recover the health of the reef. Um, we work uh, with endangered species. We work with uh, the Ridgeway's hawk, an endangered hawk species. Uh, we work in research, so all kinds of programs to uh, try and study what's happening, uh, both in environmental conditions, uh, socioeconomic conditions in local community, uh, and then apply those things uh, as needed. We also uh, manage uh, a private ecological reserve, a 1,500-acre reserve. Yes. So we're at kind of this interface of ecotourism where we have guests, we have scientific research, and then we also have conservation of species mm -hmm. happening. So. It's a good, it's a good mix of things. So, yeah. And so, um, I'm very grateful that I knew about all of your work because when the story came up, um, uh, to write about sargassum, because it's, it's really been in the headlines. And as you were saying, I mean, we've never seen so many headlines with the word sargassum in it. Um, and there was such a huge response to the story. Uh, I'm wondering you know, if it's because of all the headlines or because suddenly people's vacations are really being Im impacted, you know, um, and you've been working in Sargassum Collection since 2015. Tell me a little bit about 
how, how much of that sargassum well, have you seen increase over time and the solutions that you've come up with? Actually, the, the sargassum problem in the Dominican Republic, the sargassum crisis really began in 2011. Uh, and it really was uh, a month or two when during one summer when we started seeing huge amounts of sargassum on the beach. It was strange. It sort of went away and everyone sort of forgot about it immediately. And then the next year there was some, but not, you know, a huge amount. And then the next year in 2013, all of a sudden there was kind of a deluge and it lasted much longer the season. And since then, every year it's been incrementally more and incrementally longer periods uh, that were affected by it. And so it's been something really, in, as you said, in 2015, we really started taking a much more active uh, approach to managing the, the challenge. Um, starting with experiments with floating barriers, then uh, collection systems. And since then, we've really grown and evolved to barriers, collection systems, and transformation projects, trying to turn it into something valuable uh, to make it mm -hmm. uh, somewhat of a more manageable problem economically. Uh, in terms of the tourists, um, it's really hard to say how yeah. much tourism impact there's been. I mean, the numbers in the DR are very good, but perhaps they would be mm -hmm. even better if we didn't have this issue. Um, right. And a lot of times you have lost reservations. You don't even know, you know, people decide, hey, I heard or I read on TripAdvisor, I saw yeah. uh, that there's this issue, go somewhere else, you know. So really, I think the travelers yeah. now, they have more information. A lot of what's happening is more uh, transparent and so it's they can make decisions based on greater amounts of information that's true um now here's something that surprised me in terms of the feedback that i got um on social media which is that it seems like the dr is one of the few places that that, that actually uses barriers at sea um and one person said um, i love the idea of the barrier and i wish authorities in the rest of the caribbean did the same instead of just letting it wash up on shore. And th there were multiple comments along those lines. Um, even in South Beach, apparently it was just left there, you know, um, to rot on the beach. Uh, Playa del Carmen, a, lo a lot of places where visitors said, wow, I mean, I wouldn't mind if, if, if someone was collecting the stuff and doing something with it, it wouldn't bother me. Um, it, has that been the case that, that we're one of the few islands here in the Dominican Republic that, that is more active on this front? Well, I think increasingly more and more islands are allowing it as they see that doing nothing is really not an option, even not just for the tourism economy, for fishing communities, for coastal communities. When you have, you know, tens of thousands of tons of sargassum built up on the beach, it becomes a health issue for communities. Fishers can't get out. Uh, recently in the Dominican Republic, and I'm sure you saw it, uh, there was an electric power plant was actually shut down for a number of hours because its intake uh, system was clogged up with sargassum. Um, so it's becoming increasingly an issue beyond wow. just the aesthetic impact and the tourism impact. And so I think the initial response to sargassum is the correct one. It's a floating habitat when it's out in the sargassum sea or it's in its natural uh, a place of a place of origin or inside of sort of this natural chain where it occurs, it's habitat for lots of species, lots of fish, pelagic species, and it's a pretty vital part of, uh, of the marine ecosystem. The problem is, is when it gets in close to shore and it starts smothering coral reefs and beaches and seagrass beds. Uh, and so that's what we're trying to avoid is deflect it and intercept it before it gets in uh, and can get caught on the coast and start to degrade and uh, start to produce kind of noxious gases and, and become a real problem in terms of eutrophication on the coast. So I think there's an evolving yeah. idea about how we should manage this. Early days was don't touch it. It's a floating habitat. Nowadays, it's if we don't yeah. do something about it, it's, it causes even more problems. I get migraines from it. I mean, I've, I've actually active. I think last year was the first time I started avoiding beaches that don't clean up. Um, and Bavaro Beach, which is wide open. Wait, I... um, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. I was going to say, I, in our house, we, we suffer from uh, post-traumatic sargassum disorder, where it's like just the thought of it is, is stressful for me. You know, so it's the <laughs> smell, but also it's like this, this kind of ongoing stress of, is it there? Is it not I there? Know. Are we doing enough? Oh, Are people complaining? God. 
<laughs> so yeah. it's really well, it's a it's an emotional it. problem <laughs> now, a psychological issue. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I shouldn't laugh, but yeah, I, I understand. Um, it's 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 definitely become a factor in our house where it's like, is there sargassum there today or not? Um, and and it's very unpredictable, like you were saying. That's that's the tough part of it is, is you don't really know when it's gonna hit. Um, you said that you brought in an, or you're bringing in a new type of barrier from um, sea sea barrier from from Denmark, and I wondered. What do you think would make it more effective? Yeah. So I think, you know, the R&D behind barriers uh, has been slowly evolving. Um, and so we've seen now just on our property, probably seven or eight different types of barriers, including some that we, you know, invented in our maintenance shop and uh, others from that were adapted from other industries. Um, and in this case, uh, this company has been uh, a leader in uh, setting up barriers, uh, like floating booms for oil spills. So Sargassum represents oh, wow. like a tiny part of their business, but they've put a bunch of money into R&D and they have this kind of capacity for, for building barriers that can be seaworthy, can be um, practical in terms of installing them and removing them in the case of storms. Uh, that have more resistant materials. So now we're adapting materials that are used in the aquaculture industry for salmon farming, a different kind of netting, which is more resistant. Um, and so the idea is that these, you know, we have less maintenance, you have to re replace them less, they're more resistant to the harsh conditions of the ocean uh, and and hopefully more effective. So we, we actually have yeah. we've bought 500 meters of this type of barrier. And now we're, uh, we're in, in the process of receiving different components of almost three kilometers of this barrier that'll that'll be installed this year so we're betting on barriers right. among other strategies but um right. they're really important right. for us in terms of being being able to kind of combat this problem is this providing more jobs in terms of like collection as well like other than the uh the, the folks who collect at sea um but also on the beach right are you hiring more people for that yeah, and, and even if you look at the companies that make specialized machinery to clean sargassum uh, off the beach, uh, like beach rakes and different kinds of equipment, um, because a certain amount of sargassum is going to get through, uh, they've probably had exponential growth <laughs> over the last few years in terms of manufacturing their equipment um, throughout wow. the, the Caribbean, not just here. Yeah. And, you know, so many places are manually cleaning up. There was a, a beach nearby us. You know, we're in the process of installing barriers. And the other day, there was a, a heavy amount of sargassum wow. coming up on the beach. And they had 40, 40, 40 guys and three tractors working on a wow. beach that's less than a kilometer. It gives you a sense of kind of oh the gosh. magnitude of the problem in some places. Aren't tractors yeah. damaging to the beach? I was always wondered to ask. I mean, doesn't it pick up the sand as well? Or is there a, a method for for not removing sand? It, I mean, it's kind of the lesser of evils, I would say. You know, you you, you really, when you're getting yeah. this amount of volume of material, there's really no way around having some kind of equipment to clean it up. So these have been designed uh, to pick up, uh, you know, seaweed and sargassum mm -hmm. and try and they, okay. they kind of shake out the sand um, and you, Typically, you know, we do training courses about it. You don't want the tractor going into the wet area of the sand. You want it to try and go really slowly. Um, we have turtle monitoring programs to make sure they're not running over turtle nests. Uh, so there's a lot of measures that go into it. Um, and I would say hopefully someone comes up with an even better solution, but it's far yeah. better than putting, you know, heavy equipment and excavators and bulldozers on the beach. So. It's the lesser of, sure. of a couple of different types of evil, but um, I think at the moment it's yeah. it's the best option we have for areas where you just you can't put you know 500 people cleaning the beach and you know you mm -hmm. have to have some kind of automated solution. So um, speaking of sand, I mean coral is is key, right? To 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 us having our, our beautiful white sands in the Caribbean and elsewhere. Um, you started a coral restoration program at Grupo Punta Cana Foundation way back, I guess, in 2004. And I wondered if you could tell us mm -hmm. how far it's come along. Um, I, I think you, you told me recently there was some big coral restoration news, but I'd love to hear how you've come along in the last 
uh, decade plus. Yeah. Um, so the coral restoration is kind of a piece of the kind of toolkit that we have for helping protect and conserve coral reefs. So you really want, uh, if you have intact and healthy coral reefs to protect them uh, because it's way easier to protect something that's healthy than to try and restore it and so we look at you know marine protected areas re reducing fishing pressures making sure that boaters and recreational activities aren't impacting the reef uh, making sure there aren't contaminants and nutrients coming from onshore uh, that impact the reef and then in the case of the Caribbean, where we have like very heavily degraded reefs, uh, restoration, active restoration has become uh, very important in many countries. And so we started out in 2004, it was really only a couple of species that were endangered. So it was, this was more of like protection of these specific species. Well, in the time that I've been working in coral restoration now, close to 20 years, um, there's more species that are endangered, and now it's it's less about just individual stu pieces of coral and species of coral. Now it's we're looking at the functionality of reefs. As we degrade the reefs, they lose some of that protective service they provide uh, for coastal communities and hotels and human infrastructure, uh, and then it becomes an even greater risk when we have big storms and and uh, and, right. and major weather and rising seas. So we really want healthy coral reefs. And so the the technologies and the methods that we do to produce, use to, to produce corals has evolved too. So it used to be just growing a handful of corals in underwater nurseries. Now we're growing a variety of coral species in land-based nurseries and increasingly seeing new technologies come online to, to help assist it, make it more efficient, make it more cost-effective. So uh, automation, looking at uh, batch processing like you have in factories where you can grow tons of corals together and then outplant wow. them onto the reef together using kind of new systems. Uh, we're even using AI to help us with monitoring techniques. So uh, putting underwater cameras wow. out that can then collect data on what the health of the reef and the reef species are, um, looking at population dynamics in that way. So it's really interesting um, that the you know, on the one hand, the reefs are in such bad shape that now we really need these right. kind of moonshot type technologies to confront some of the problems. But there's a real uh, passion and interest from kind of the technology, innovation, entrepreneurship side to apply some of the things they do really well in other industries to coral restoration. So it's really interesting what's happening. You know, we're kind of on the, the beginning of what I, you know, I call this like the restoration revolution. Uh, and hopefully, you know, that these things will help us, you know, speed up uh, some of the recovery of the reef and the and the reef functionality more than anything. Is there any uh, destination that you think is a model also for for innovation in this space in the coral reef space? I know the Bahamas had had some experimental work as well. I would say one of the the big leaders, you know, kind of one of our uh, you know, pioneers that we that we know really well, and also just just really um, appreciate the work they're doing uh, is in Belize. Uh, it's a group called Fragments of Hope, oh. uh, and they're really recovering oh, yes. like the scale at scale uh, the reef restoration. So you're seeing diversity of species, you're seeing recovery of uh, fish and other organisms that hadn't been there before, creation of kind of new jobs and new tourism activities around it, and not just you know where we see in a lot of the Caribbean kind of little patches or a handful of nurseries. Now they're yeah. doing it at a pretty right. large scale. Um, you know, they have a lot of advantages. There's not a huge amount of development in some of the places where they're working. Well, I want to move on to, to travelers as, as our last topic. Um, there's so much talk yeah. in the industry about how travelers are becoming more conscious and they're more interested in sustainability and um, checking off all the right boxes on surveys. And I, you having a sustainability center on your grounds, as well as luxury hotels, I wonder how often do you see your luxury guests uh, wanting to look at your sustainability center and, and learn about your initiatives? Is that is that something that happens often or more? I would say more and more. Um, I think there's definitely a growing awareness, a growing interest. Um, I think we're also trying to find ways to give like experiential opportunities for our guests so they can try something new they can meet an endangered hawk or they can see our beekeeping operation or they can visit a reef that we're restoring 
Um, but I typically uh, think that it's our job as destination stewards and as managers of a local resource in a hotel and a resort, it's our job to, to make this turnkey, to really be looking after our destination, taking care of our local community, taking care of our local natural resources, because the, you know, the trends and sort of the, uh, the whims of the traveler can kind of come and go and change, but sustainability, this is, this is a long-term play uh, and it requires commitment over a long period of time and perseverance in the face of new challenges and a real commitment. And you can't do that based on, you know, passing fancy of, you know, guests. We want our guests to engage in it. We want them to pressure us and question us and really want us to be pushing the sustainability agenda. But it can't depend on that because, you know, it's just too fickle of a crowd. You know, <laughs> this year they might care. Next year they might be more interested in something else. <laughs> and I just can't yeah, turn my operations year, they... of my programs off as guests become... Yeah. <laughs> it's right. not like the color of the That's year for you know fashion like sustainability is long term well thank you so much that's a great place to end uh thank you so much jake for sharing your your insights and i, I totally agree on that last point uh and hopefully we we won't get as much sargassum as, as they've predicted so uh we'll see thanks so much jake Pleasure to have absolutely you. Hey, thank you for having me. I appreciate it.